So we'll go ahead and get things started. Um, thank you all for coming. And as we, we do begin, I want to introduce myself. I'm Jeremy Jackson. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Public Choice and Private Enterprise. I'm always happy when I get that mouthful out successfully. Um, but we're here a part of NDSU, and we're inside of the Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. Our mission statement is, is currently up on the slide. Um, just want to let you know that we, we exist to produce programs like this and educational opportunities and research on the, the institutions that enhance human well-being. And that's a big theme that I think we're going to see through the presentation um, today. I have a couple of things of housekeeping that I want to address um, as we get started. First of all, if you like today's event and like some of the things that we do, one of the great ways to know about our other events is to follow us on social media. So we have a presence on Facebook, Twitter, and someplace else too. I forgot. That's okay. But uh, do follow us on social media because that's one of the ways that we can keep you updated on the things that we have going on. Um, we do have a reading group program that we have. We call it the Manser Olson Scholars Program. We'll be opening up that program for applications shortly. Um, the application deadline is November 20th. The, one of the great things about the Manser Olson Scholars um, is that it's an opportunity for you, A, to read some good readings, but also to get together and talk about them with other students. And for your efforts, you also get a $500 scholarship. And for events like this, when we bring a speaker in, you also get some one-on-one -on -one time with the speaker. Um, so there's, it's a really good opportunity for you to network and get some experience um, talking about really interesting issues. The topic for next semester is going to, it's actually pretty exciting, regulating food and vice. That sounds like fun, right? Um, so keep, keep an eye out for that announcement and apply if you're interested. Um, in addition to today's talk, we're also going to host a second talk in October. Um, we're, we'll be hosting Ed Stringham. And he'll be talking on private enforcement of contracts from eBay to blockchain. And that event is actually a prequel for a conference that we're holding on Saturday, October 28th. So we're also hosting a conference called Research and Practice on Blockchain. And it's a great opportunity for you if you're interested in something like blockchain and learning the ways in which it can influence business and society. Um, it's, a, it's a conference that's open to anyone who's interested, students, faculty, or anybody from the public. Along with that, we also have a poster contest that we're hosting for students. So if you have an idea on a way that blockchain could be used, maybe it's like a business proposal, something like that, um, you can submit a proposal to be in the poster session, and we're giving away prizes for the top three posters at the session, and uh, the winners will get a uh, NDSU bookstore gift card. So first prize will get a $250 gift card to the NDSU bookstore. So again, um, submissions for that are due on October 8th. And we also have a new program, especially there's probably at least a couple faculty in the room. Um, a very new program that we're starting is that we have the opportunity to provide some grants to faculty who are also pursuing things that help accomplish the mission of the center. So if you're interested in applying for a faculty grant, um, be on the lookout for that. We also have grants available for students to help students travel to events as well, um, which that's my next slide. So if you are a student that's interested in traveling um, to maybe a conference or, or an event, we have a nice list of events that we can help point you to. Um, but we have the ability to, to, to help you with the cost of getting to, to a lot of various events. Last thing I want to mention, and we have this, this over here to help you, um, we've found that for these events that it's been very convenient and adds to the smoothness of having our question and answer time if we use an app called Slido. Um, so if you're interested in submitting a question at the Q&A time at the end, you have time during the talk to download the app. And as you, after you download the app, um, you'll have to enter in a number 
we're number E744, and that'll take you into the entry point for Slido, where you can type in your questions, um, and then we'll address questions that come up there. With that, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. So today we're hosting Robert Lawson. He's a professor of practice and Jerome M. Fullenweider, Centennial Chair in Economic Freedom, and the, direct and the director of the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom at Southern Methodist University Cox School of Business. Dr. Lawson is a co-author of the widely cited Economic Freedom of the World Annual Reports, which present an economic freedom index for over 160 countries. Lawson has numerous professional publications in journals including Public Choice, the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, the Cato Journal, Kyklos, Journal of Labor Research, Journal of Institutional, Institutional and Theoretical Economics, and the European Journal of Political Economy. Lawson is a past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute and a member of the Mont Pelerin Society. He earned his PhD and MS in economics from Florida State University and his Bachelor of Science degree in economics from the Honors Tutorial College at Ohio University. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Robert Lawson. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my second time to North Dakota in about six months. I've never been to North Dakota until this year. So two times in one year, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll make a habit of it and keep coming back. It's a beautiful place. I drove through last time, so I got to see a fair bit of the state. Um, I'm so happy to see so many people here. I understand there's some extra credit going around. Is that true? Yeah, that's OK. I don't care I'm, uh, while you're here. Uh, I got you now. So I got you for about 45 minutes. And we're going to talk a little bit about economic freedom and the wealth and health of nations. Uh, I'm going to start by telling a little bit of a story. Um, I used to be an undergraduate like you at Ohio University, uh, go Bobcats, same color, sort of. We didn't have the yellow, but same color, green. Uh, and when I was a student at Ohio University, we used to argue with each other. Uh, and I used to wear Adam Smith ties in college, and I'm wearing one right now. In fact, this is literally the one I would have worn in college. This is something like 35-year-old tie. And Adam Smith, there, he's my hero. As you all know, probably, he wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations in 1776. And in that book, he argued, uh, well, he had a lot of arguments, a lot of things to say in that book. It's a very thick book, 1,000 pages. But in that book, he argued for what he called a system of natural liberty. He said, if society organizes itself according to this system of natural liberty, the society will work pretty well. Now, what does he mean by system of natural liberty? He, would, he means what you and I would probably call free markets, or laissez-faire, or private enterprise, or capitalism. We would use, probably in today's terminology, some other term. But his term uh, was system of natural liberty. I'm trying to actually bring it back, because I think it's a lovely phrase, system of natural liberty. Um, he argued that this system would work pretty well. The wealth of the nation would be larger. People would progress, flourish. They would do well. He was no utopian. Adam Smith was, he understood that we don't live in heaven, we live in, on earth, and uh, on this earth that we live in, we're going to have uh, uh, unlimited wants and limited means of achieving, of satisfying those wants. But Adam Smith uh, thought that this system would work pretty well. So let's put him away. Then this other guy, Marx, I've never had an Adam, I've never seen a Karl Marx, I've seen a Groucho Marx tie, but I've never seen a Karl Marx tie. If anybody has a Karl Marx tie, uh, let me know, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Maybe I should get, maybe switch them, like stitch them together, it'd be fun. Uh, so Karl Marx came along a few months, or a few months, a few years, a few decades actually, after, after, Mark, after Smith. And he said, this guy Smith, um, and the classical economists like Smith, uh, they're, they're not right, they're, they're, they're wrong. Um, capitalism, and capitalism was Marx's favorite term for this system of natural liberty that Smith called it. Uh, he, Marx said that capitalism is not going to work out as well as the economists like Smith said it was going to work out. And if anybody studied Marx, the Marxist economics, there's a sort of a long laundry list of complaints that the Marxists have about the operation of a capitalist system. It will lead to unemployment, business cycles, monopolies, uh, exploitation. Uh, in fact, according to Marx, uh, the system of capitalism will become so bad and so awful for so many people 
that eventually the working class will rise up and violently overthrow their, their supposed capitalist overlords. So what we have here is two incredibly important, I think, I think the two most important figures in the history of economics. One of them, my hero, Smith, I literally wear Adam Smith ties, one of them says, hey, free market capitalism works pretty good. We should have this system. And Marx says, no, it's going to be horrible. Now, these two fellows can't be right. All right? And we've been debating. There are Marxists and there are, I don't call them Smithians very often, but there are capitalists out there. And we've been arguing with each other for a very long time. And the arguments that I remember at my Ohio University days were a lot like these two fellows, these two uh, people here, this boy and girl on the bottom there. Um, I would say something, uh, uh, Ohio University is a party school, so usually we were drinking. Um, but um, I don't think they do that here at North Dakota State, right? So, no. Um, so we'd have a beer, and I would say something like, you know, we should, um, we should have more free trade. And my Marxist or my social sense, and I had, I had communist friends, too. I mean that literally. Uh, they would wear red armbands on May Day and march through campus with pictures of Mao. So when I say they were communists, I really mean they were communists. So my communist friends would say, no, we should, we should uh, uh, have protectionism to protect the poor and the working class from the vicissitudes of global capitalism or something like that. Um, so we would have arguments and then we'd have another beer. And by the end of the evening, what happens? Uh, I'm pointing fingers at them, calling them commies and pinkos, and they're calling me a greedy capitalist pig or something, right? Uh, it's like Facebook. See, my, when I was in college, we had Facebook. We just did it face to face. We just got mad at each other right, right in front of each other. Um, you know, at the end of my years at Ohio U, I don't think a single one of my communist friends, and again, they really were communists. I'm not, uh, I don't think a single one of those people became convinced that I was right. And I left, I graduated and I left, and they had really not, you know, changed my views either. So, the, you know, we have this sort of romantic notion that debate and conversation is supposed to give us, to help us reach the truth. If we just talk it out, we'll figure it out. That's not my experience. My experience is we just scream and yell at each other like, and, and call each other names. Um, I'd like to contrast that experience, which I think is what most of, go, most of what goes on in social sciences and the conversations that we have with each other in the social sciences, like economics. I'd like to contrast that with what goes on in the natural sciences. Now, I'm a frustrated natural scientist. If I had been a little bit smarter, if I, you know, another 10 IQ points, I would have gone into physics, astrophysics. And I still play, I still dabble in physics. I go to physics department seminars at SMU. We have a very, very, very strong department. And uh, it turns out they argue with each other there in, in the astrophysics uh, uh, seminars. They argue with each other about this or that. But there's a difference to the argument. What are they arguing about in astrophysics? They're arguing about data. It's about data and evidence. They've got, oh, they got it. We got some new, new data from this, uh, from Hubble. We got some new data from one of the other telescopes. And they're trying to read the data and see whether this data is consistent with, with your view of how that star or how that system is supposed to operate and, or another person's view. It's all about the data. It's a big lab. When, when scientists and the national scientists disagree with each other, they collect data. And they look at the data. And yes, they argue about that very frequently, but it's data driven. And at the end of the day, when the data tell you, uh, when the data say that this, uh, th this, this evidence is more consistent with a particular view, then we, we keep that view. And when it's inconsistent with a particular view, we get rid of that view. And slowly but surely, we, we discard bad scientific ideas and we keep better scientific ideas, and now we all live in this, this, this has been going on for several hundred years, we now live, in, we're all the recipients of these, this marvelous technological age where I push a button and that thing, I, I, you know, it's like magic, right? I, none of us understand really how it happens, but it does happen. I would like economics, my, my chosen profession, I'd like economics to be more like those white lab coat guys and less like these Facebook screaming and yelling people, okay? But to do that, we need data. And that's what brings me to the project that I became involved in as a graduate student and been working on for uh, about 30 years. Actually, it's exactly 30 years uh, because I started working on this project the winter that the Bengals lost their second Super Bowl. Um, most of my life events are surrounded by, uh, are anchored by when Bengals have lost the big games in, in my history. There are a lot of those memories. 
So, um, measuring economic freedom. What I think we need to help adjudicate, to help settle this debate between Smith and Marx, is some data telling us which countries are following Smith's system of natural liberty the most. Which places on this earth that we live in are more capitalist, and which are less capitalist. Because Marx said the places that are more capitalist should have all kinds of problems. And Smith said the places that are more capitalist should have less problems, should be better places. But the first thing we got to do is get some kind of evidence for, uh, for who's got the most capitalism. So I want to measure economic freedom. I want to I'm going to call it economic freedom, not capitalism. I want to measure how much economic freedom people have in their lives, how much economic freedom they have how much capitalism they have, if you will. Now, it sounds hard to measure something like capitalism or freedom, but you know, we measure things that are hard to measure all the time. Uh, every year we measure who the uh, top college football team is, uh, and sometimes that's you guys in your division, right? I, like, apparently it's your every time. Uh, uh, it, I, I keep saying to all my friends who live here, says, have you guys bought condos in Denton, Texas yet? And you should just buy a condo because you're there every year. Um, um, so. Uh, but we put, do, you know, every year we put a number you know, in the, in, uh, what used to call it Division 1A, whatever they call it now. Uh, do, does, somebody wins that every year. There's a national champion. Do we all agree every year that's the right winner, that's the best team? Even after they play the, the no, no. My friends at TCU down in Fort Worth are still screaming and yelling about three, a few years ago. Um, so we, put, we put numbers on things that are hard to measure all the time. In your economics class, I presume you've studied or you will study gross domestic product, the dollar value of all the new final goods and services produced in a calendar year. Um, GDP is an incredibly mind-numbingly complex number that we estimate. It's the dollar value of everything Americans make in a year. Do we get that number right? No, we know we don't get it right, right? In fact, right after your professor tells you what GDP is, defines it in class, the entire rest of the class is about all the problems with GDP. All the things that GDP does wrong, all the things it includes that it shouldn't include, all the things it doesn't include that it should include, and so on. We know GDP is a deeply flawed measure of the size of the American economy, uh, but we're gonna do it anyway. And next year, we're gonna calculate GDP wrong again, and we're gonna compare next year's wrong number with this year's wrong number. We're gonna call the difference between those two things economic growth, all right? So we measure things that are hard to measure, and we measure things that we, we know we won't be able to measure precisely all the time, but we still think the effort of doing that, I think the world is better off for, having, for trying to measure GDP. Same thing with economic freedom. I wanna become a measurer of economic freedom. I'm gonna go into it eyes wide open knowing that we won't be able to do, do so as precisely as we'd like. But hopefully we'll still learn something, just as I think we learned something from GDP. So, the project itself is entirely data-driven. Um, there are 42 variables in the current index. There's 162 countries in the current index. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that because you all would walk out long before I got anywhere near the, the end. I just want to talk for a few minutes, though, about the kinds of things that are in the index. These are the five areas of the index. The area, these 42 variables are slotted into one of these each of those 42 variables is slotted into one of these five areas. And I'd just like to talk briefly about each of the five areas and, and give you a feel for the kinds of data that go into the, the economic freedom index that we end up with. The first area is size of government. How big should the government be? And I'm talking about taxes and spending. How much money should the government take from you and then spend on whatever governments spend the money on? How, how much should go on in that tax and spend environment? Uh, Adam Smith actually wrote a whole chapter in The Wealth of Nations about, about what he thought government should do in terms of taxation and spending. Um, in terms of uh, what government should do, according to the Smith, government should have uh, cops, well, national defense to keep the French from invading, all right? Should have cops to st stop bar fighting, because he, he was a Scottish guy, so, you know, bar fights in Scotland is a thing. So, uh, you know, have an army and a navy to keep the French away have cops to settle you know, uh, disputes in the streets when people get drunk and fight, have courts, have judges and courts to settle contract disputes so that if we don't agree who owns this piece of land or who owns that cow, that we can, we can settle those disputes without you know, duking it out in the streets or having duels or other things that, uh, that we don't want to have. So 
police, uh, national defense, courts, the sort of basic administration of justice, he says, well, we should have, he had a pretty good understanding. Who studied public goods in a, in a class yet? Have you ever heard of public goods? Some of you? Nobody? Yeah, you have. Okay, good. Somebody. Um, he had a pretty good, uh, although a little bit elementary, but he had a pretty good understanding of what we today call public goods. He talked about how, it was in, how maybe the government should provide things like roads and bridges, infrastructure type items. Today, we would, we would include those under the umbrella of, of what we call in our textbooks today public goods. Uh, he also had a little bit of a section in there about how governments should provide education uh, to people. He was a little bit wishy-washy on this one, though. Uh, one of the interesting facts is that, is that uh, in Scotland, his education was, uh, for all intents and purposes, private education. The government didn't really support it very much. Um, in fact, one of the practices in his, what he would call his undergraduate era when he was in Scotland, uh, uh, the, the, the students, this is, this is a terror, uh, Jeremy, this is terrifying. We, we, we never want this to come back to, to, into practice. But in, in Smith's Scotland, when he was a student, go to lecture, he went to lectures, the practice was that the students would pay the professor that night for the lecture, right? So that's how the professors made their, their income, their salary. They, they got money directly from the students each and every lecture. Now, um, you can imagine uh, the professors uh, in Scotland, they were pretty good. They showed up, they gave entertaining or enjoyable lectures, or at least not horrible lectures. He went to what we would call graduate school. He went down to Oxford for his more advanced studies. And the professors at Oxford, they got paid through a salary. They, got, they drew a salary from the treasury. Um, what happened in Scott, what happened at Oxford? The professors, half the time, they didn't show up to class. Sometimes they show up and they would just read, they would go up and they're like, they're black robes, you know, and they would stand at a, at a lectern and they would read out of a book. That would be the lecture. Well, Smith is no idiot. He said, you know, I can read a book myself. So he stopped going to class. He spent his entire several years at Oxford uh, studying by himself in the library. <laughs> so anyway, the long story is that Smith, Smith said, governments, it's a pretty good idea to maybe educate people, and maybe governments are, are well situated to do that. But then he says, you know, the way they do it down there in England isn't so, isn't, doesn't seem to be working very well. At least his experience wasn't that great. If you can, now that list is basically, that's the end of the chapter. So courts, cops, some national defense, some roads and some bridges, maybe some schooling. And that's the end of Adam Smith's chapter on how big government should be. How big is, how big is that government compared to the governments we have right now? Very small, right? Like the city of Dallas where I live, I live in the, in the city of Dallas itself, uh, we own a hotel. The Omni Hotel is owned by the city of Dallas. That wasn't on Adam Smith's list, right? Some, some countries own uh, shoe factories and things. That's not on Adam Smith's list. Right, we have rec centers and swimming pools. and all, Those are all great things. I like hotels and rec centers. But Adam Smith said government should be doing this very small thing. If you, Adam Smith was a radical small government guy is what I'm trying to say. Radical. He makes Rand Paul look like a commie, right, in comparison. He's a really a small government guy. So in our index, I just collect data from the World Bank and the IMF primarily on how big the government, how much money do they tax, how much money do they spend. Countries that spend a lot will end up with lower scores because Adam Smith is a small government guy. So small government countries will get better scores. This is, gonna, this is kind of an Adam Smith index. The second area is uh, security of property rights and rule of law, um, legal structure issues. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on this gentleman right here because you're right in front. What's your name? Preston. 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 So, uh, Preston, suppose I give Preston $5 to wash my car. I uh, hand over the $5. Preston says, yeah, I'll wash your car. Uh, and, but I didn't know this, but you already know this because you all know who Preston is. He's kind of a flake, it turns out. He didn't actually, he doesn't wash my car. He runs down to the pub, drinks a beer with my $5. Uh, Preston is, is he's, he's welched out on a contract. Uh, in effect, he stole my $5, right? If you give someone $5 under a promise that they will provide some service and they don't provide the service, they're not terribly different than a mugger who just takes $5 from you, right? So let's suppose I sue Preston in North Dakota or Texas or somewhere in the United States. I sue him. I say, Judge, uh, I gave Preston $5 and he didn't to wash my car. He didn't wash my car. It's an open and shut case. The World Bank actually estimates how long it takes to settle simple contract disputes. That's a little bit, I think the case they use is a little bit more elaborate than a $5 case, but they actually estimate this. So question, how, how long do you think the World Bank, now this is the World Bank data, I don't know how much time it takes in real life, but how long do you think the World Bank says it'll take to, 
to settle a simple contract dispute in an American court. Six months, a year, five years, what do you got? Three years? They say it's only one year. They say one year. Okay. Well, if it takes one year to get my money back, that's some security, my property. I get my five hours back after a year. If it's six months, even better. My, my five dollar property, my property is more secure if it only takes six months than if it takes a year. If it takes six years, uh, it's not very secure, right? I mean, you know, you're basically going to have my five dollars in your pocket for, for six years. So we have data from the World Bank on how long it takes to adjudicate, to settle simple contract disputes like this. So, the, so countries where, it gets, where it's able to you do it faster and also cheaper, those countries get better scores. Your property is more secure in that environment. The third area is uh, sound money. This is, uh, uh, I have a, this is a silly story, but uh, when I turned 16, my dad uh, gave me, a, uh, he didn't give me $100. My dad never gave me $100. Uh, he said, you should get $100 and fold it up and hide it in some resource recess pocket of, your wa of my wallet. I turned 16. I was now driving. And, you know, this is the 80s. There were no cell phones and, and such. So, you know, and I drove a Volkswagen Beetle, um, and it broke down like every four miles. I still drive a Volkswagen Beetle, um, and it breaks down every four miles. But, um, but I, so I drove this crappy old car. And uh, you know, hundred hours was you know, and just in case you break down, you need a tow truck or you need, you need to bribe a cop or something. I don't know. Um, so I, I do that. Actually, the car I don't really need a tow. So after a year, I remember I cleaned out my wallet and I found the hundred dollars, and that's always fun, right? It's a good day when you find something you kind of forgot about it. Um, what happened? What's the problem when I take that hundred dollars to the store a year later? It's not worth as much, right? Because of inflation. The purchasing power of that $100 has gone down. Now, it's physically the same $100. Like, it's literally the same $100 bill I put in my wallet a year ago today. It's the same $100. But when I take it to the store, if inflation has been 5%, then it's like someone took $5 out of my wallet. They physically didn't, but it's just like that. In fact, monetary economists uh, talk about inflation having a tax-like component to it. If you've got $100 in your wallet and inflation is 5%, 5%, it's like someone takes $5 out of your wallet over the course of the year. It's like a tax or like a mugger or like, like Preston here who took my $5 and didn't, uh, didn't wash my car. So what we have here in area three is measures mostly from, from International Monetary Fund uh, and also some from the World Bank on basically inflation. There's a couple other things in there, but it's all about how secure you are on your monetary assets. This would not just include money in your wallet, but it would incur any assets you have like a bond, a lease, mortgages, uh, insurance policies, things like that. The fourth area is probably the area that if you, th if you know Smith, it's probably the area that you're, you identify with most closely with Smith. Smith was a free trader, right? I mean, a large part of the reason for writing The Wealth of Nations was to be an advocate for, for the English, well, I should say British, he was Scottish, uh, for the British trading freely with the French and other places. Now, that's a terribly difficult argument to make in 18th century Britain. The English and the French had been on again, off again, enemies for hundreds of years, bitter enemies. And this crazy Scotsman is writing this book saying, hey, we should trade with those people. We'll be richer if we trade with them. And they'll be richer if they trade with us, but we'll be richer if we trade with them. We should have free trade. That was his argument. Uh, it was a difficult argument to make in his era. Is it still a difficult argument to make? You don't have to read, be too, you don't have to be too in, aware of current events and the president and all this other stuff to know that it's still a very difficult argument to make that, that a country should trade freely. Well, Adam Smith, for better or worse, was an unabashed free trader. So we have measures of tariffs, quotas, uh, also some measures of capital controls, which is inter, uh, you know, basically the equivalent for, for financial flows. And uh, again, countries that have lower tariffs, countries that make it uh, have less regulation for trade, those countries get better scores. They're more like what Adam Smith wanted. And then the last area is regulation. Uh, it's got a lot of different things, um, credit, labor, and, and business. Let me give you just a couple examples. One of them is we do have some minimum, we have like the minimum wage. What would Adam Smith say about the minimum wage? Is that consistent with economic freedom or not? It's not, because it's, it's a regulation that dictates the price that people can buy and sell labor at. 
Right? Now, maybe it's a good idea. I understand it's quite a popular law, but it's, it's inconsistent with the Smith system of natural liberty. Uh, another example is they ask, uh, this is also from the World Bank, kind of like the, the contract dispute case, they, there's a section in there where they estimate how long and how difficult and how expensive it'll be to start a simple business. And I think it's like a warehouse. I'm sure you have a lot of warehouses here up in ag country. Uh, so, you know, warehouse, you know, big building, you know, put stuff in it, trucks come up, take stuff, drop stuff off, you know, a warehouse. How long does the World Bank say it takes to start a warehouse business in the United States? I'm talking about the regulatory process. How much, like, government paperwork, how long do you think it's going to take? It's not a nuclear power plant, it's just a warehouse. Six months. They say it only takes a month. I've never tried to start a warehouse business in the United States. I don't know how, how difficult that is. I suspect it might be a little easier in Fargo, North Dakota than, say, New York City, but, but they say 30 days. Okay? That's, that's pretty easy. That's actually not that bad. Now, a few years ago, it's gotten much better today, but a few years ago, when I first started working on this data set, uh, Egypt's number was 3,000 days. The, the World Bank estimated it, it would take 3,000 days and 42 distinct government offices that you had to, to get approval from to start a warehouse. <laughs> Again, a warehouse is not exactly the most exotic type of business, right? So uh, if you're an Egyptian in Cairo you're, and you want to start a warehouse, that's, that's like eight years, right? I mean, what do you, are you going to start a warehouse? No, you're not going to. You're not going to stand in 42 lines and wait eight years for these paper, this paperwork to go through. You're going to either start your business without the paperwork, start it illegally, and there's a lot of illegal businesses in Egypt, or you're going to bribe your way through that process. You can shorten that eight years to you know, eight weeks if you, uh, you know, bribe your way through. Um, or you can just move to America and open up your warehouse in 30 days. So those are the kinds of, these are the kinds of things in, in the index. So if you want to get a good score in this index, you want to have a high economic freedom score, you want to have a relatively small government, you want to have a good, sound, efficient, operating legal system that adjudicates disputes fairly and quickly. Uh, you want to have a, a, a monetary system that doesn't have a lot of inflation risk. You want to have something close to free trade. You want to have low tariffs. And you want to have a regulatory environment that, that makes it easy for people to start businesses, makes it easier for people to hire and fire workers, and, and so forth. Okay? So that's what goes into the index. There's 42 variables, though, so I'm just giving you sort of the, the overview. Now, uh, which country do you think is the, I say country because that would get some arguments, but which place is the highest place, the most free? Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong's number one. Um, it's always been number one. I knew it was going to be number one. If any other country had come out on top besides Hong Kong, I would have known we just botched the whole index. And the reason for this is if you know anything about Hong Kong, the top tax rate is 15%. That's what billionaire Hong Kongers pay. Top rate, 15%. The top rate in the United States, depending on what state you live in, approaches 50, 50 percent okay? So taxes are much, much, much lower. It's a much smaller government. It's about half the size, relative to the size of the economy, about half, relative to GDP. It's about half the size as the American government, and probably about a third of the size, say, of a, of a European government. It's a small government place. The legal system in Hong Kong is extraordinarily uh, fast and efficient. One of the things that Hong Kong does that I think is really cool, at their appellate level, at the second level of courts, not the trial level, but at the next level, they actually hire judges from other common law countries, like England, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and they bring them, they pay them a ton of money, and they bring the best judges from these other countries and say, hey, come to Hong Kong, you be a judge here. So they actually import the highest quality legal talent that they can find from all around the world to come be judges in Hong Kong. And then, of course, they advertise that. You open up business magazines like The Economist or something, you'll see these advertisements about, hey, the legal system in Hong Kong is so efficient, we have the best judges come do business here. And God forbid, if you have a business dispute, which sometimes happens, you know, we'll, we'll give you a fair uh, shake. We'll give you a good legal system. There's no real inflation problems in, in Hong Kong. What's the tariff rate? What's the tax on imports in Hong Kong? They don't have any, so it's a trick question, a little bit. There are no tariffs. It's complete free trade. It's exactly what Adam Smith advocated. They have no tariffs. They have no quotas. They do have a customs office, which is only records 
what kind of comes in and out of the country, but they don't have any collection of duties or taxes of any kind. Uh, remember that how many days it takes to start a business? Uh, one day in Hong Kong. Just one day is what the World Bank says. The uh, minimum wage in Hong Kong in, in U.S. dollar terms is about $2 an hour. Um, it's meaningless uh, in Hong Kong. Okay, so Hong Kong is number one. They get a nine out of ten. I should have mentioned how do we get the nines and the eights and the sevens. How do we get, it's a ten-point scale. I just convert all those raw numbers using an advanced branch of mathematics called arithmetic to, um, to turn all those raw numbers from the various sources like the World Bank and IMF. And I just use a formula and they all get turned into zeros and tens. If you're interested in those details, I'll give you a link later. But uh, so 10 is the highest score, zero is the lowest score. 10 is like Adam Smith, right? Uh, Singapore is very much like Hong Kong. The top tax rate, I think, is 20%, uh, but it's basically the same uh, in a lot of ways as Hong Kong. And those are the two freest economies. They've always been the two freest economies. Every year I've done this index calculation. We've done this index calculation back to 1970, and it's always Hong Kong one, Singapore number two. Um, and I'm pretty sure if I could push it back even further, it would, it would be Hong Kong and, and Singapore one and two, all the way back to you know, at least the, the end of the war. Um, then it gets interesting, though. We see New Zealand, uh, Switzerland, Australia. United States is sixth. United States is, is back up to sixth. We were down to 16th. We've been, we, we, were at, we were at three, 16. We we're kind of bouncing around a lot. The United States is currently sixth with an eight out of 10 score. Uh, then you see the rest of the country. There are a couple weirdos up there. Uh, most, of you, m most of you don't know where Mauritius is. It's a little island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's technically part of Africa in a like ge geographic sense, but it's primarily um, populated by South Asians, Indians and of various kinds. Um, and then my favorite country, uh, Georgia. Is there a laser on this if I do that? Oh, it doesn't matter. So Georgia's on there. Georgia's the, not the state, that's the so former Soviet Republic, the country uh, of Georgia. And I'll talk a little bit about them maybe in a second. Uh, just, um, I, we have 162 countries. I can't show you all 162. You, the, the font would be infinitesimally large. So I'll show you a map in a second. But here are some of the larger, more interesting countries, uh, population-wise or, or for whatever reason. So again, the U.S. is sixth. Then you see the highest rated Latin American country is Chile at 15th with a score of about 7.8. Uh, the colors are indicating quartiles. So a country with a blue is the top 25%, green is the next 25%, and then yellow and, and, and red. Obviously, I had to use red, right, for the bottom. I mean, right, I mean, what else would I use? Um, so you see these are the more, some of the more populous countries. Generally speaking, the countries you think of as being the capitalist countries come in blue. The social welfare states of Western Europe, like the Italy's or the France's of the world, will tend to come in green. Uh, and then you'll get into some sort of whatever, whatever you want to call these places. Uh, I get a lot of questions about China. Uh, China is currently, this is literally the first time I've done it with the new numbers. Uh, th this is the updated data. Just, I don't even think we've released it yet, actually, to the public. So you may be the first people to ever see these numbers. But uh, I keep looking back because I haven't memorized them yet this year. Uh, China is 108th. Um, and I get a lot of questions about China. Uh, I don't have a number for China in uh, 1975. Or 1980. What number do you think they would get if you could just make up a number? Maoist China. Out of 10 point scale, economic freedom scale, what? 0.5? 1? I, I, I don't know. Okay, very low. Okay. Uh, what do they get now? Uh, six and a half. Okay. Eh, as, as, I don't think there's any question about it. China is vastly more capitalist, vastly more economically free today than it was under. Mao in the, the communist days of the 70s and in, into the 80s a little bit. Um, are they very capitalist, though, in the grand scheme of things? Not really. They're still below the halfway mark. If you want one data point about China's economy, uh, the entire banking system, the entire capital system in China is owned by the government. Now, process for a second what it means. If you're a Chinese citizen, you want to open that warehouse. Maybe it's not that hard to open a warehouse anymore because, you know, we've liberalized a little bit in China. You can open businesses now. So it's not that hard. But you've got to get, get raised some capital. So you've got to go to the bank to get a bank loan to start your business, to buy your warehouse. The person who's the bank officer, 
the person on the other side of the desk who's evaluating your loan application, he is not just a bank officer evaluating your application on its merits, your creditworthiness, whether your business plan is sound, and so forth. He is, in fact, a Communist Party official, a member of the, of the government. Now, I don't know what your definition of capitalism is. My definition of capitalism doesn't means that I don't have to ask the government's permission to get a bank loan. But in actual fact, that's essentially the system in China. So China has definitely liberalized a lot. There's a lot of economic activity going on in China. But it's still a heavily regulated, heavily controlled economy. Now, the big multinationals, you know, Reebok, Apple, they don't need to worry about uh, the Chinese banks. They can get their capital from Chase Morgan or you know, whoever they want, right? Okay, J.P. Morgan or whatever. All right, but China's still got a long way to go. Um, Venezuela's dead last, 162 out of 162. They were fighting a little bit with Zimbabwe for last place, but uh, Venezuela fought harder, uh, and they're last. Uh, which is, this is quite tragic. Venezuela used to be blue. <laughs> uh, they used to be in the top 25% in, in like 1970. We didn't have as many countries rated them, but they were in the top quarter of the countries we were, able, we were able to rate back in the 70s. So today they're dead last. Now you might be asking, where's North Korea? Why don't we have North Korea? I mean, surely North Korea is the least economically free and least free in any, any context place in the, in the world, right? Why don't we have North Korea? Can't get IMF yeah, they're not members of the IMF, the World Bank. That survey where, they, where the World Bank goes and f tries to figure out how long it takes to open a warehouse, they don't get to do that in North Korea. So there's no data on North Korea, at least none that we would believe. Uh, so no data no, not on our index. We're a really a data-driven index. We will not include a country in our index unless I've got a critical mass of data published by the international organizations like, uh, like, like those. We also get data from the World, uh, World Economic Forum, PricewaterhouseCoopers, a lot of places. So likewise, Cuba is not scored either. Uh, Cuba is a little bit easier to get some data, but they're still not they're not involved, they're not uh, cooperating with any of these organizations either. So. so Venezuela is last. There are countries that are worse than Venezuela, though, I'm pretty sure. All right. um, here's a color map. The kind of the colors are okay. Every, every projector uh, kind of treats the colors a little differently, so I have to look. So you can see the blue countries, those are the top 25%. The green are the second 25%, then yellow, and then the, the lowest 25%, the lowest quarter of the countries is colored red. Now, the... Um, there, I figured out how to do it. Uh, I didn't have a number for the Soviet Union in 1975 or 1985 uh, for the same reason I don't have a number for North Korea today. There was no data for the old Soviet Union. Uh, but we see the, the parts of the old Soviet Union, uh, that's Russia, it's below the halfway mark. It's yellow, meaning it's below the, the median. It's in that third quarter. Uh, but some parts of the old Soviet Union, the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, they're blue. And uh, there is Georgia right there. If you didn't know, Georgia is right there off the Black Sea, north, sort of northeast of Turkey. Georgia and Armenia are also blue. And so you saw Georgia is sixth in the world. Now, this is 2018. They declared independence of April of 91. So this is 27 years. So more or less a generation, a little bit beyond the lifespan of most of you, but not very far beyond your life. Georgia was the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic. It was a constituent part of the Soviet Union. Um, about as far away from capitalism as any place on earth has ever gotten, the Soviet Union. Uh, and Georgia was part of that Soviet Union. Union. They broke away in 91. Um, they actually didn't begin liberalizing much until around 2014, but they've been liberalizing very hard, and now they're sixth. So we have a country, it's not a very big country, I think it's a country of about four million people. I visit Georgia frequently, I've been there about 15 times. I like to remind everyone that my city is bigger than their country, but uh, it's a very small place. Uh, but that country has gone from being part of the Soviet Union to having an economic freedom score that is roughly speaking on par with the United States. In 20, really they did it in about 15 years. That is the most stunning transformation that I think any economy in the history of economies has ever achieved. You could also say something very close to that for Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, but Estonia as well. So the Soviet Union, when it broke apart, they were all Soviet Union. And the little parts, they all went their own way. One of the most fascinating things about this index, I think, is tracking these countries as they, they progress. All right. I want to amble towards a conclusion here. Leave some time for Q&A. 
Who was right, Smith or Marx? Smith was right. This is GDP per capita, organized by red, yellow, green, and blue. So quartiles. The top 25% of the country are blue. This is GDP per capita. This is the best measure we have of standard of living. $40,000 per person on average in the blue countries. Six thousand, less than $6,000 on average in the red countries. Economic freedom creates more wealth. It's more productive. Smith was right. This picture might not have surprised Marx. Marx understood that capitalism was productive. What was Marx's big complaint? Yeah, 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 capitalism produces lots of stuff, but it all goes to the, to the rich, right? It all goes to the rich. Here's the data on the income share of the bottom 10%. So imagine you've got 100% of the population. Just ignore the top 90%. Let's just focus on the bottom 10% and ask ourselves, what share of all of the income in that country that's earned goes to that bottom 10%? Turns out it's about 2.5% everywhere. Some places a little higher, some places a little lower, but if you look at the red, the green, the yellow, and the red countries, it's about two and a half percent of the income going to the bottom 10 percent of the population everywhere. In fact, free market capitalism, the countries, let's call it the blue countries, the countries that have the lowest taxes and the least regulations, the countries that are more like Adam Smith's system of natural liberty, in fact, those countries are not more, equal, more unequal than the countries that have more taxes and regulations. Marx was flat out empirically wrong on this question. My favorite graph is life expectancy. I like life expectancy because we get good data. It's really good data. Some of the data in the last chart, I have to be admit, our data on income distributions around the world are not as good as we'd like them to be. But the beta we have show that. So this is life expectancy. So about 80 years, if you live to be 80 years, uh, you're in a blue country on average, if you're in a red country, you live to be about 65 or 64 years. It's a big difference, 16 years difference. If you live to be 80 years old, you will live old enough to see your grandchildren be born, your grandchildren grow up, and you may live long enough to see your great-grandchildren. My daughter is 23 years old. Uh, until very recently, she had a good relationship with her great-grandfather. He just died. My, my grandfather just died. But uh, my, my grandmother's still living, so my daughter is 23, about your age, a little older than you, maybe, most of you. She has a close relationship as an adult human being with one of her great-grandparents. How many 23-year-old human beings have ever, on this, who have ever lived on this planet knew their great-grandparents? It's a vanishingly small percentage of the, of, our, of the people who have ever lived on this planet who can, can say they knew their great-grandparents as an adult. That's not a, if I asked, if I pulled the room, I suspect there's lots of you that know your great grandparents. And the reason there's lots of you that know your great grandparents is because people live a very long time nowadays. But they live a very long time primarily in the blue countries, not in the red countries. Um, infant mortality, uh, this one goes the other way, but that's right because we want it to go down. And then poverty, I'm going to cut through a couple of these. All right, last one happiness indexes. Have you heard about happiness indexes? How happy are you right now? I'm a 12. As soon as I get a drink in about an hour, I'm going to be like a 40. Uh, actually, I think happiness indexes are really too sketchy, but they have data on how happy people report to be. And I'm happy to report, no pun intended, actually, yes, pun intended. I'm happy to report that more economically free countries actually report, the people in those countries report themselves to be happier. For whatever that's worth, I'm not sure how much I trust happiness indexes. I'm an author of an economic freedom index. I think that's sketchy all, you know, this is really sketchy. But anyway, it works. And then lastly, and, and we'll hopefully have some time for questions, um, our website, this is not actually the website, but they made up a funny, freetheworld.com will direct you to the proper website. If you go to the website, all of the data I've described, how many days it takes to start, settle a contract dispute in Uganda, it's in there. How many, you know, days it takes to start a business in Zimbabwe, it's in there. How, what's the tax rate, top tax rate in Norway, it's in there. So the entire spreadsheet with all the data, all the ratings, how we do the math, if you're interested in the, in the arithmetic, the algebra, uh, that's all in there. So the entire data set's available for you to download. Uh, and if, you, if you're in an econometrics class, God forbid, I, f I pity you, but if you are um, and you don't know what to do, you don't know where to find data, go grab our data and you can run regressions all night long. Uh, Jeremy, I am, I think, finished. Yes. How's that? Nine that's minutes. Good. Thank Eight you. Minutes.